summer camp counselor, I expected to be face painting kids, singing camp songs, and distributing Capri Suns. I didn't expect to be taking care of people who look like this. When I went to apply to be a CIT or counselor in training for the summer camp, I was given a form to fill out that looked something like this, where I was asked to choose which of these options I wanted to help out with the most. So I'm making my way down the list, and I get to this option, Robert R. Brown. This isn't one that I know off the top of my head, so I go back to the main page to read up on the unfamiliar fifth option. The website informs me that this is a camp for adults with, quote, physical and developmental deficits. Now, I don't have a personal connection to anyone who falls in this category, and of course, these deficits fall in a wide spectrum. So there isn't a one rule fits all for how you relate to these individuals. Because of this, I rated this camp last. It would probably be better for me to do a year or two of a more typical summer camp, get some experience under my belt, and then maybe attempt this more challenging option. So we submit the application, and a couple of months later, we get back a list of who's been chosen to be a CIT and what camps they'll be helping out with. Maybe my references were a little too generous with their judgment of me, because someone thought I was responsible enough to take on Robert R. Brown. I didn't even know how to refer to this camp and its participants. I'd heard them referred to as disabled people, differently abled people, special needs individuals, impaired people, handicapped people, and each of these had a version where the phrase was flipped. Instead of disabled people, people with disabilities. Instead of handicapped people, people with handicaps. And I knew that the wrong terminology could quickly become offensive. I didn't know what was and was not acceptable. Would campers be offended if I referred to them as handicapped? Would staff? I had nothing to go off of at this point. So I expressed these concerns to some of my friends, family, and a couple of my teachers, who helped me come to the conclusion that, you know what, I'm going to go through with this. A week in residence doing something that I have no experience with and have never done before, I've got this, probably. So my parents drive me up the mountain when the time comes, and as they go, part of me knows that there goes my lifeline. I'm up on this mountain until this camp runs its course, or my social ineptitude causes me to wither up and die. Whatever happens first. We're given a little bit of time to settle in before we all gather in front of the main lodge in order to wait for the bus full of campers that set to arrive. One of the first people we see is Jimmy. Not only is Jimmy an adult, he's well over six feet tall and makes an imposing figure. Immediately after exiting the bus, he moves quickly toward one of my fellow CITs, points at him somewhat aggressively, and loudly announces, I'm proud of you! Smiling from ear to ear. While unconventional, his greeting served to put us all at ease. So I stayed at the camp. And I learned that what I was doing was not as hard and definitely not as frightening as I had originally thought that it would be. And whenever I came back, I began to question the reactions of fear that I had had. My reactions aren't uncommon, even if they are unfounded. Pretty often, people feel uncomfortable whenever they're put in a scenario with someone who has a disability. The most common response is to avert your eyes and move on. What about this situation makes us so uncomfortable? These people are, when you take a closer look, actually very similar to us. They also have aspirations, they also have family, and some of them, like Gerard, also have some impeccable dance routines. How they differ from us could be very slight. They could just have issues with reading or writing, or it could be much more apparent, with them having clear mental hindrances as well as physical handicaps. Either way, those who have happened to end up like this are often looked down on in society or looked away from. Part of our discomfort is understandable. It's a difficult issue to talk about without inevitably offending someone. But why have we ended up in a society in which this is the case? Historically, the attitudes toward those whose physical or developmental growth is delayed have been even harsher than they are today. Those who were born with such defects were often vilified as some kind of evil force or ended up as social pariahs. In 19th century England, those who were deemed unfit to participate in the workforce were placed in asylums, where attempts to rehabilitate or cure the afflicted individuals were few and far between. In the 1890s, a woman named Mary Dendy showcased the popular opinion toward people with disabilities, saying that they should be detained for the whole of their lives, and that this was the only way to stem the great evil of feeble-mindedness in our country. In 1881, Italy's Congress outlawed sign language for fear it would result in a deaf or hearing-impaired populace overtaking the current healthy norm. The environment was one full of fear and disgust, and remained this way for quite some time. It wasn't until the 1970s when advocates such as Mike Oliver began pushing back and trying to change these kinds of social views. They pushed back against current laws as well as formed support groups and communities where they could engage with others affected by these circumstances. This sense of community was one that I undoubtedly felt during my time at camp. Many of the campers lived in residential housing units, went to the same activities, and were otherwise closely knit. They could always walk out their front door and have someone tell them, I'm proud of you. 
And so this kind of discomfort really wasn't founded. It wasn't until the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 was passed that it was commonplace for establishments to be wheelchair accessible, or the designation of handicapped parking spaces became widely encouraged. So it wasn't until pretty recently that we began trying to dramatically increase this kind of social acceptance. In the aftermath of camp, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about this kind of issue, and that seemed pretty surprising to me, that we have this kind of long, deep-rooted fear of these individuals. It's not founded at all, it's irrational, and these people are really very, very similar to us. Whenever I came back from camp, I was thinking, and I realized that I went from worrying about how I was going to relate to a stereotype, to helping my friend Trevion catch a fish for his girlfriend, cheered on by Jimmy's reassurance of his pride. It turned a minority into a real group of people who I engaged with and grew to know. If I had looked only at the narrow view presented to me by society, I wouldn't have been willing to take this opportunity to get to know these people. A little over a week ago, ex-president George H.W. Bush passed away. His presidency is defined in part by his willingness to advocate for people with disabilities. He's the one who signed the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. Now, George H.W. Bush wasn't disabled himself, so why did he go to such lengths to incorporate handicap accessibility into everyday American life? Well, in 1986, he met with Lex Frieden, the then director of the National Council on Disabilities. Frieden showed him a bill that they were trying to get written into law that would later become the Americans with Disability Act. After reading through it, Bush assured Frieden he would do everything in his power to get these measures written into law. Four years later, Bush won the presidency and came through on his promise. Although it wasn't at the front line of the political debate, Bush's experience with an individual opened his eyes to the issue. In his later years, Bush became confined to a wheelchair himself, and he had access to buildings and public transportation thanks to ramps, sidewalks, and parking spaces that he helped institute. The issue of disability isn't one that's meant for press releases and statistics. It's one that's based on and founded by one-on-one -on -one interaction. It may be frightening to think about spending the time to get to know these individuals, but the people and the experiences you can take away from this are well worth taking that first step. And if you ever need some words of encouragement, remember, I'm proud of you. Thank you. <laughs>